So yesterday, we created a we we loaded a model from the AnyLogic example models, and I'm going to just go load that again because uh, while I've provided you um, a variant of this, it's uh, uh, this is a useful point of reference. This is one SIR agent based calibration. How did I get here? I went to help example models, and whoa, okay, great. Um, and uh, I, I scrolled down and I went to SIR agent based cal calibration here. Okay? Now, this model, you may remember it because we interacted it yesterday with it yesterday in one regard. It was this Monte Carlo 2D histogram. We used this to run sensitivity analyses and to see the effects of stochastics. What I'm actually going to look at today is this calibration experiment here, which is an optimization experiment in any logic. Um, it's one of these types of experiments that you can add. And you will find online uh, uh, videos of me, quite a large number of videos, some in two different sessions where I'm covering both the concepts and how to implement um, calibration in any logic. Today, I'm going to con uh, focus on just the highest level concepts and the highest level understanding of, of what it offers within any logic and the interface to it with any, any logic. But basically, it's an optimization experiment that I used, okay? Here we go, calibration. So, we're going to run this experiment and, um, and use it to, to just point out a couple features, okay? So ladies and gentlemen, calibration involves tuning model parameters. So you may remember I, I mentioned this yesterday in its essentials, and I'm only going to fill in those essentials again. Um, we are interested here in, uh, in, uh, in setting our assumptions for exogenous parameters, okay? Our assumptions involving exogenous parameters. And those exogenous parameters will affect the model, which is running with endogenous factors. Um, and these parameters are broadly estimated with one of three processes, okay? With a process of direct parameter estimation, and there's a, there's a sort of minor variant of it called backing out, where you have to do some calculations. And generally speaking, for parameter estimation, there's some you, if you take original data, often there's some bits of analysis you have to do outside of the simulation model to put it in a form that can go in the simulation model. That's one form. The second form you use to estimate these comes from filtering. That's a much more advanced topic that I covered three weeks ago on, in, in my boot camp uh, two weeks ago today. Um, I was discussing it still in that other boot camp. I'm not going to go into that, but it's the province of PMCMC and for dynamic parameters, parameters part of the filter. What I'm going to be talking about today is calibration. And calibration involves leveraging data to estimate these parameters. But the data that we're leveraging is empirical data, not about any one piece of the system, the piece of the system that involves the parameter we're trying to estimate but it's rather data about behavior of the system more broadly, often the whole system or large portions of the system. And the idea behind calibration is that we're going to, even if we, if we, have, if we have data about a certain, if we have a parameter that we want to estimate, we want to arrive at a, at a value for that parameter that we, we, we want to use as its estimate, um, we, we may not have data about that, but we have data about a lot of other things about the model, um, including the models and the outcomes of the endogenous behavior of the model, the, the observed behavior that's generated by the model. Because the en endogenous components of the model generate, they, they generate patterns. It's, it, they characterize the data generating process associated with the model. So the endogenous features of the model are being produced by the model over time. It's calculating them. That's the notion of endogeneity here. It's, it's, it's uh, generated by the model. Exogenous factors we tell to the model what to assume. 
endogenous factors are told to us, calibration is a way of figuring out from the model's observed behavior and comparable data from the world what to assume about particular parameter values where we don't have any good data directly about those parameters. So the idea here is we have a, wow, ain't that something? Wow, okay, well, I'll be. Um, this this uh, suddenly seems to have given up the ghost. Um, well, okay, so here we go. Okay, um, here we go. Okay, we have this parameter. Maybe we don't have estimates directly from the world. But we know this parameter is going to affect the endogenous behavior of the model. And as we, as we change this parameter, maybe the endogenous behavior of the model will change quite a bit. Maybe it's a very sensitive parameter, demonstrated by sensitivity analysis. Okay, so maybe we will try, this is what, what calibration does, is it says, okay, let's pick a value of this parameter, which will allow the model's endogenous behavior to match as closely as possible data we have from the world about the emergent patterns from the world. So maybe it's number of incident cases over time for pertussis, or maybe it's the number of individuals dying um, from diabetes-related complications over time, or maybe it's, um, it's uh, aspects associated with the um, the, the call center uh, volume for suicide-related hotline calls. These things generated by the model, if we have model expectations for them, and we have data from the world that correspond to that, we tune the value of this parameter. We adjust our assumptions about this unknown parameter so that the model behavior uh, best matches comparable behavior to the world. And that doesn't guarantee to us a correct value for that parameter, but at least it, it, makes, it gives a certain face plausibility to the model that's a reasonable guess for that parameter. And so that's what you see going on here. We have historic data shown in yellow. Okay, there's the, the yellow data. Um, and, um, and then we have model output from assuming different parameter values, okay? So um, here, Right now, we're assuming a contact rate, so we're trying to determine two things, infection probability and contact rate. Um, uh, here we have a certain assumption about contact rate, a certain assumption about probability that we are, we are putting forward as a possible combination. We're gonna assume this about contact rate, then about contact, uh, infection probability, and we see what, what output would the model produce for that assumption. And we're going to, do this again and again and again with different values for contact rate and infection probability, what I might call a, a parameter vector, a value, a parameter uh, a value vector. Um, so a, a set of things. We're going to try it for a contact rate 3.079 and infection probability 0.763. We're going to see how well it matches the historic data for that, and then we're going to try it for contact rate, you know, 4.23 and infection probability uh, 0.625. And we'll see how well that matches the empirical data. And we'll keep on trying that, these different assumptions about these two parameters until the model matches as closely as possible this historic data. And once it matches that, we, as closely as possible, if it's a good match, we have some plausibility at least that maybe these two parameters, here are two parameters we're trying to estimate, um, maybe we have at least a reasonable guess as to what they might be in the absence of other evidence about those. Maybe we don't have evidence directly about those things, but we have evidence about model behavior as a whole here. Often we have several types of evidence of this sort, and as we're adjusting those possible assumptions about those parameter values, we're seeing how it, how it stacks up against all these different types of evidence from the world about the behavior of the system more broadly. The, the endogenous behavior of the system we match against comparable data from the world, and we try to make them as close as possible. And if we end up finding a really good, plausible, you know, a really good match that data from the world that tells us, okay, that's at least a plausible set of assumptions 
about those about those two values in the absence of anything more. Okay. Now, often, as I said yesterday, it doesn't match exactly. And and this is where you get to learn something big because you can you say, okay, why isn't the model matching it? And you need you need to learn to walk through that. And uh, I have a set of guidelines for doing that that I'm sharing with you in a set of slides. I'll, I'll be posting them. There's some versions from last year on there. But basically, how to think through when the model isn't matching it, how to work through why it's not matching it, so you can, and, and, and by so doing, mark, match your thinking. So the idea here is, as we're running this, I don't know if you, you see it, for as we're running it, you see this um, jumping around, this blue line is shifting around, it's trying different values, and it's saying, um, you know, oh, okay, how does this match, how does that stack up, how does that stack up, and this red one is the best one yet. It's the best one that's matched that. Um, and in fact, this calibration progress at the top, that's matching how good the best one is so far over successive tries. So it's trying different combinations of these, and it's saying the best one I found thus far, how big a discrepancy is there in a quantitative way from the empirical data? To do this, you're actually specifying a discrepancy metric. You're saying, how do I judge for the model output and for the output from the simulation, how do I judge how far apart they are? That was this difference we called this, there's a, a function in any logic called difference. It can take two data sets and compare their difference. And this is what's being displayed on this calibration progress graph is, is the difference there, the, it's so-called objective function. And it's trying to find combinations of parameter values that are, are good matches, and over time it finds better ones, it finds better ones yet. And it's, oh man, those two were really, in, in retrospect, those weren't that great. This one is a real diamond, you know, I'm gonna, uh, that's the best one, that's the best going one yet. And so this red line is showing the best going one. It's kind of the best running estimate for those parameters, how far off the model is from the empirical data. And it's getting better. You notice up here, the, the red line was, was quite high, it's between 1,500 and 2,000, then it went down to about 600 or so, and then it went down to maybe, uh, I don't know, 200 or so, and then 150. It's getting better. In other words, it's finding combinations of parameter values that allow the model to get closer and closer to its fit to the empirical data. And the fact that this red line is going down means it's, this is kind of the best yet match it's got, how far off the, the two are. And it's getting closer and closer, so it's less and less far off, and that's getting smaller. And, it, and you notice it makes breakthroughs sometimes. Ah, oh, I've got a better one. Better than all the ones yet. These, these little gray dots, those indicate various attempts. And you see there's many misfires, right? Like, even after it found this lowest one that started at about time 70 through 100, 145 or something, it was trying lots of other possible combinations of parameters that were a lot less good. They, were, they had much bigger discrepancies or somewhat bigger. So it didn't choose any of them as the best one yet. But then finally around time, I don't know, 145, it found something even better, and it lowered it yet further, the discrepancy. It said, ah, oh, I've got a better running gap, a better working hypothesis. And that's the one shown in this, um, uh, the, the, in the red on the, the yellow over here under best. 4.6 and 0 0.131 is the best one yet. Now, I oversimplify a bit, because there's a fly in the ointment here that some of you might have noticed. Um, it's possible you will have noticed um, something a little bit peculiar here. Ladies and gentlemen, this model is an agent-based model. And when we are in the sphere of agent-based models like this, we have to deal with what sort of phenomena? Anything? Stochastics. So each of these runs is affected by these parameter values. But with the same parameter values, the same exact parameter values, 
If you run it again and again and again with different random number seeds, you will get slightly different results. And so, you know, we're fooling ourselves a bit. If we say just one run, we can determine how good a match it is. How, how good a match it is. How, how, what the discrepancy is from the empirical data. We'll be fooling ourselves if just from one run with a certain pair of parameter values, we can say, this is a great set of parameter values. Um, someone could recently ask, how do you know? You only ran it once. How do you know it just wasn't a lucky fluke? You know, lucky strike. Lucky draw. Um, you just you just happened through the vagaries of stochastic to hit it right on the nose. But maybe if you ran again with those two parameter values, you'd be far off. And maybe you're fooling yourself. Maybe it's not the parameter values you got. Maybe it was just you were lucky with stochastic. Fair question. Reasonable question, ladies and gentlemen. So what do we what do we do about that? Well, you notice it's down to to objective 79, how much is that polluted by the, the vagaries, the fluke of, of what we happen to get? Well, what we do to deal with that, we put into place here um, something called replication. And in fact, that's what's going on here. We're actually running, each time we run the ball, when I told you I was running it with those parameter values and seeing the objective, I was so simplifying. It's actually running it five times. Here, why do I say five? We said, yes, we want to use replications. Those of us who are more mathematically inclined, we tend to call this realization. We're running an ensemble of realizations for each, for a given parameter vector. You know, uh, 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 contact rate equals this, and infection probability equals that. A particular combination of specific values for them. We actually run it five times. We can run this ensemble of different realizations, five of them. And then we take the average objective function. Now, um, you can imagine, whoa, oh man, okay, um, huh? um, uh, so we take the average vector, and you can, you can reasonably say, how do we know five is enough? And in fact, we can, any logic as a criteria, which is described to you in my slides, which basically says, hey, you can actually choose how many replications to have a certain level of statistical confidence in the standard, in the mean, um, the sample mean of the results based on the observed variability you see between runs. If you, if you see very little variability between the runs, maybe you don't have to run many replications. These different realizations are giving very similar results. Maybe you don't have to run many, but if you if you um, have, you see a lot of variability, maybe you need to run many. And so there's this criteria here, and I actually derive what the, the relationship is. And, and and you can set a minimum and a maximum so you don't go to town with you know, hundreds of replications, but neither do you ever run fewer than 10 or whatever. And um, and this, this gives you some statistical confidence that you arrive at a good calibration value. Now, um, I could speak for hours. And on the internet, you will find the videos of me speaking for hours about this, but not between you and lunch. Um, and I will tell you, moreover, that, um, that uh, there's a lot of, of practical sides to this. Um, in terms of setting up calibration experiments and, and using appropriate metrics for discrepancy and so on, which are talked about in my slides. Um, many of them talked about my slides. But perhaps most importantly, it's the view of this, it's important to view this not as a turn the crank exercise to just get past the speed bump in the road to get past to have your good model with all its good estimates. This is your chance to understand why the model can and cannot make sense of certain evidence from your world. When you run into problems with calibration, it, there are lessons to be learned about model dynamics and about what the model can and cannot account for, et cetera, um, that are very valuable. 
and it's worth it's worth grappling with it, not in an impatient way to get finished, but so much as because this is the nexus of a lot of learning. It may be learning about the model and its limitations or strengths, how it sort of, and, and even sort of uh, the dynamic lessons learned from it, but it's also a matter of learning about the data sometimes. And I mentioned these cases where we just couldn't calibrate the data. We could not match it well. And we went back tail between our legs only to be told, you know, about problems in the data that we didn't know about or the people talking with us about had, well, certainly they had never mentioned them until we brought it up or people didn't know about them at all until they looked into it. And so it, this is part of, again, model, the modeling process as a learning, as, as valuable as a learning tool. Sometimes it builds up institutional knowledge about the, the limitations of our data, of our evidence, and, and points out to us where our, our vaunted evidence is misplaced, or, or you know, our, our sense of uh, extreme confidence in certain types of evidence may be misplaced. I will also note that amongst us, sitting in the back row with a fedora adorning her head, is the queen of calibration, none other than Chen Yang. Um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, the, you're the queen of calibration, and hence she wears a crown befitting her, um, with a tiara around it. Um, sorry? Fedora? Fedora, yes. Um, so, um, so uh, she has enormous uh, experience with this, and if you're interested in the practicalities of it, I'd suggest you talk with her because um, our group does specialize in calibration processes. And uh, in addition to those videos of me talking about all sorts of you know, technical details and how you implement any logic, um, the, the, the sort of um, uh, nitty gritty of it uh, and, the, um, uh, and the sort of very um, intense uh, scientific learning part is something that Yuan could help you uh, probably understand if you were to speak with her this afternoon. So you're welcome to do that. I'm also glad to talk about this in more detail. I'll, I will refer you um, just uh, here to the slides and we'll break for lunch. So um, there's a uh, calibration set of slides here, which are chock-a-block full of, of uh, you know, re valuable uh, components involving uh, calibration, okay? So um, here we go. And they vary from understanding of how to undertake it um, within any logic in a mechanical way. Um, it's sort of uh, how, how to think about it, noting there's this kind of parameter space where adjusting different values of parameters and we can think of ourselves at any one time with a particular value, let's say, of, of um, infection probability and a particular value of, of that contact rate. Um, at a certain time, we're at a certain place in a, in a space. Um, maybe it's a 2D space, one parameter and another parameter. Maybe it's a 3D space where three parameters we're adjusting. We're kind of trying to find places in the space in other words, combinations of possible specific parameter values, certain coordinates in the space where we have really good matches. So we're exploring the space. And it's worth noting that as you go from two dimensions to three dimensions, how much you have to explore is much bigger, right? If all I have to explore is one dimensional, it's like searching along this board, the bottom of this board for the highest place. All I have to do is kind of scan along here. It's quite easy. If I have to search a whole 2D space, it's more involved. 3D is more involved, yeah. And so as you need to calibrate more parameters, you need additional evidence to calibrate them generally. I have some suggestions on, on, um, uh, on discrepancy calculations and so on. And I have some comments how you undertake this in any logic. I should probably show that for a moment here. So this is our calibration going on. Um, but what enables that is a set of specifications of like what to vary here. 
in the calibration under parameters. There's what to vary and over what range to consider it varying it. Um, and then, although I don't show it here, but, um, uh, but it's something Jan could talk a little bit about, we can further say essentially, hey, don't allow any cases where parameter A and parameter B sum to more than one. Maybe we're tuning A and B, but we never want them to be greater than one. Or maybe we want to throw out all simulations which ever had the infection die out, because that's totally unrealistic. And so we screen those out. And any logic can impose these constraints on simulation parameters, like A and B never totally to more than one, and you're varying A and varying B. Or um, after a simulation, it can look and say, this simulation is unworthy. It's, it's, it's not worth considering as a, even if it's low discrepancy, it should be discounted because of some criteria. And we can impose that, okay? Um, so we're adjusting these things to minimize this discrepancy, and this discrepancy is calculated using output from the model together with output historically. And in my videos, you'll see me explain how those uh, things from the model are, are, are filled in. That's, that's right here. These are in the slides. Uh, sto impacts of stochastics, and I talk about uh, uh, the relationship um, between different uh, quantities here and how you implement it. This is the statistical notes on those criteria and the throttling of the number of replications here um, in order to achieve a level of statistical uh, confidence. Um, and then I, I deal with this calibration problems, but really these are calibration learning opportunities, um, how to how to learn from a, a calibration that's not working well, how to turn that into a learning success, um, and, and how to deal with, um, with ways of, of getting it better yet, okay? Um, lots, of, lots of evidence, um, or lots of things to think about oh, gathered over many years. So those are some quick comments on calibration. Calibration is an extraordinarily powerful tool in the arsenal of, uh, of dynamic modeling. It is one of the ways that we make use of the often rather large amounts of data that we have on areas of the model that, are, um, that, that relate to model outcomes, and therefore we can't use it to estimate a parameter because they tangle together all sorts of things. Um, Jason, camera. Um, they tangle together a lot of different factors. We can't, there's often a lot of data like on model outcomes, or on, simi, on system outcomes, that we can't use to estimate any one parameter because it results from a tangling of lots and lots of other parameters, lots and lots of model states. But this calibration is one way we can use observed evidence that's emergent patterns from the world, whether it's things over time or particular data points measured at, at just one time, or whether it's certain things like men have higher rates of, of this condition than women, uh, or there's more asymptomatic women than men for this condition. We can use those outcomes, um, we can use those facts from the world to judge um, discrepancies with model outcomes and find estimates for our parameters that were less well evidenced um, such that they best match those, um, that evidence from the world, whether it's more, um, uh, more high level, like with rates among women are higher than those of men, or whether it's a very specific time series. Calibration is very important, very valuable, and um, it's kind of a poor man's uh, version, a poor person's version compared to uh, uh, what we can get out of filtering techniques uh, more, more generally, um, and particularly part of homes. Okay, so that's all we have time for right now. We'll break for lunch uh, for an hour, and after lunch we'll break into groups. I'll be going around as I did yesterday, amongst a bunch of different groups. Hope to visit all, and then at some point, uh, probably around uh, four o'clock, we will, 4, 4.30, we will reconvene. We will uh, go through the community site and we will talk about trade-offs between different software packages for this sort of modeling. And we will talk about resources for further, uh, further work and um, uh, 
close up the formal lecture components of the boot camp, recognizing that I will be here bright and early tomorrow morning, and I hope many of you will be as well for further project work to, to help bring some of these projects um, uh, home, okay? So I'll look forward to, uh, to joining you in your small groups after lunch.